Gold has had a volatile year, piercing $2,000 an ounce very briefly before coming back down. What were the drivers of the price moves and what's next? Well, different institutions have different price forecasts. Capital Economics, for example, is predicting $1,650 an ounce by the end of the year. Jim Cramer, on the other hand, he's advising people to buy gold now. Joe Cavatoni is with us today. He is a regional CEO of the Americas for the World Gold Council. Previously, Joe was a managing director at BlackRock and has served in senior positions at UBS, Merrill Lynch, and Bank of America. Joe, welcome to Kitco. Great to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure is all mine. Joe, we're going to talk about the pillars of gold demand, so investment demand, central bank demand, jewelry demand, and industrial demand. And then we'll talk about some of the programs that the World Gold Council has recently launched. So let's start with investment demand. Now, you recently, uh, the World Gold Council has recently put out a report noting that the gold physical demand uh, might stagnate for the remainder of the year. Well, let's let's just I'm just going to read the article here that was written about this. Uh, the WGC said that the challenging economic environment presents obstacles and opportunities for the precious metals. Uh, in the mixed outlook, the analysts said that the persistent inflationary pressures coupled with growing market uncertainty will support gold prices through the rest of the year. However, solid momentum in the U.S. dollar will act as a significant headwind. So I'll just let you comment on some of these forces here. Which is stronger, the headwinds or the tailwinds, Joe? Well, that's to be seen, but that's encapsulating the beauty of uh, gold in a nutshell. Basically, what you're hearing and what you're understanding from that article and from that simple statement is that gold serves more than one purpose. It has a dual nature. It is a safe haven asset, and it is also an asset that will react when people are actually seeing opportunity and risk on moments in the market. So you're, you're seeing and you're hearing and you're getting a sense of how gold is moving around over the course of the first half of the year, but the headlines are important to understand. Demand is still up. The metal is still being talked about extensively across, like you said, investment, consumer and jewelry, central banks, and also an industrial. So the metal is still relevant. The metal is still top of mind for people. And just to put it into context in terms of a return profile year to date, gold is ranking third amongst major asset classes, even mm -hmm. if the negative return year to date, third amongst major asset classes, just trailing behind broad-based commodities and dollar. So really interesting time for looking at gold, really important time for people to understand the dynamic of what's going to move the price over the course of the next six to 12 months, because lots of risk factors, like you've said, are out there. Okay. So let's talk about uh, some of the factors that we've mentioned so far. So let's talk about inflation first. Now, the article that I cited uh, was talking about uh, the report that the WGC has put out. And in the report, analysts have called for inflation pressures to persist. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And what's interesting about gold, I, 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 unlike some of the other commodities where you're seeing fast reaction on their price movements against uh, inflationary pressures, gold usually is a laggard. And it's a laggard simply because people are looking for the opportunity costs short term first, mm -hmm. and then they move into the asset, which we have uh, you know, track records of showing performs well during inflationary times. It's a savings asset, and it's actually a strong asset to hold in the portfolio or in an investment context when you're seeing the inflationary measures that are going into the markets. I'm curious and remember to one thing important, sorry, the, the, the yeah. one thing I want to make sure we make speak clear note of, that this is not just a US phenomenon. This is actually a global phenomenon. And gold is probably the best asset to look at when you think about global risk and global return. I'm just curious as to uh, which assumptions the analysts at the WGC were using when they predicted the inflation to persist. I've heard that from several analysts, but also other people have pointed out to me that uh, we are technically in a recession. And if you look at all the prior recessions going back to the 50s, almost every single one of them has been followed or coupled with declining inflation. So in almost no recession in the past, have we seen inflation persist or rise even higher? Are you assuming right. that this time is going to be different if you think that uh, inflation, inflationary pressures will persist? Well, I think the, the, the right way to respond to that comment is to simply echo what I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at um, standards and, and data and information that's actually targeting, you know, what we're experiencing heavy handed in the U.S. market, whether we're in an inflationary market or we're in a recessionary market. And honestly, it's very difficult for people to tell and land on an answer to that. What I think is also important to note is that if you see what's playing on the European markets, the inflationary markets or the inflationary tone in those markets is definitely persistent. And if you try and get a flavor for how much 
gold is consumed on a global basis, you'll see that using the ETF market as an example, about 50% of the flows this year have been into ETFs into Europe. So you're seeing gold performance not only impacted by the questions and the complexities of what's playing out in the US market, inflation versus recession, but you're also seeing the effects of it globally. So it's a global asset consumed in large scale ways in Europe, and it's consumed in large scale ways in China, India as well, and around the globe, you're feeling it. This is an effect of post COVID. This is the effect of, of the knock on effects of, uh, of supply chain challenges. Sure. So we've got, a, we've got a really interesting environment for the gold market right now. Well, generally speaking, uh, how much of the gold price is impacted by investment demand alone? So it, it, it depends on what the dynamic is in the market. So what I think we've seen through the course of the last few years with COVID, investment was definitely having much more of an impact on moving the price. Why? Because it's not something you need to be doing uh, feet on the street or trafficking as a consumer. Mm -hmm. So when you think about what's been moving the price, strong demand in investments, and you're seeing strong demand among central banks, the central bank buying continues to trend up. And what you're seeing in terms of, of, of the first half of the year, um, ETFs, for example, had a very strong first quarter, which offset a lot of the pressures that were on on the price and also the demand for gold in the second quarter. So I think it depends on the time of the year. It depends on the market environment. And it depends on what we're seeing in terms of what are the forces that are moving the price. On our website, we have a tool known as Graham. And Graham will help people understand the dynamic of what helps drive the most recent movement in the gold prices. I'd encourage people to use that tool and understand how, how that can help them benefit to get a, an understanding of what's gonna move the price. So yeah. consumer demand has been less so influential on the gold price because people have been under lockdown over the last few years or are coming out of lockdown and actually you know that's starting to see some some changes in terms of what we're picking up there right. well we encourage people to visit that website uh, in the meantime maybe joe you can uh, explain to us the forces that uh, have moved the gold price first to above two thousand dollars an ounce earlier in march i believe uh mm -hmm. and then the forces that have uh pushed the gold price back down to below eighteen hundred dollars an ounce which is where we are today, I'm speaking to you on Wednesday, we're about 1793 an ounce. That's right. So what moved the price quite simply, geopolitical risks, the Russian invasion. Terrible set of circumstances, but unfortunately, a flight to quality gold moved aggressively in reaction to that. Now, subsequent to that, we're starting to see the more broad economic factors and rate movements that are starting to impact more movement on capital, so risk assets selling off and actually opportunity cost, actually mm -hmm. putting a bit of price pressure on gold and also people looking to move their assets into the right risk environment. You saw a major move in equity prices. You saw a major move in bond movements. The rate movement that the Fed and other central banks around the globe are doing is having the impact as of late. And that pressure is a consequence of people using gold as a liquidity vehicle. I think we're off just around 5% year to date. They're using it as a liquidity vehicle because again, relative to other risk assets, it's performed exceptionally. And also what they're doing is moving into risk assets, dollar strength. So that's what's been putting the pressure on, on the gold price as of late. But the beginning of the year, it's a geopolitical risk issue that moved gold very aggressively. Well, the geopolitical risks uh, moved gold to uh, above $2,000 an ounce. Um, the question is, why didn't gold sustain above that uh, above $2,000 an ounce, or at least maintain a similar level? Are, is the gold market suggesting that the Ukraine-Russia crisis or war would eventually solve itself and that things would not escalate? Is that what gold is suggesting? I think what, what, what the price movement is suggesting is that people flock to the metal knowing that it's a safe haven asset. Mm -hmm. In times of uncertainty and risk and concern, there's definitely a flight to quality for the gold market. But when people start to move their risk assets, gold yeah. will take a price pressure moment. And that's what we've just described, which is where should I have my assets? Is there an opportunity in bonds? Is there an opportunity to, to reallocate to equities or how should I be thinking about my portfolio allocation? I think what's really interesting about the price performance is that the price is held up. And actually the trend line that we're seeing is continuing to be up. So the gold market hasn't done what maybe it had done in the past when there were euphoric moments of price, price appreciation. It's holding. And that's yeah. actually really interesting, particularly when, at, when, when gold prices are trending down or troughing at any point, you'll find that that's when consumer demand or jewelry demand, mm -hmm. those buyers will step in. And those buyers have been constrained by things like lockdown in China. And okay. still these days are where, where we're having 
slower consumer demand coming online because of factors like that. So I think it's really interesting to see that the gold price is holding and actually continuing its trend line in a direction that's favorable. Uh, roughly, how much did the, uh, did the war in Ukraine add to the uh, gold price? In other words, what is the geopolitical risk premium? You'll recall that prior to the invasion of Ukraine, gold was already on the, on the uptrend. So yeah, how much it, of that did it push it? On the uptrend, you know, I, 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 we, we tend to want to stay away from predicting the price of gold or mm -hmm. calling what, what this specific event has done for the price of gold. Mm -hmm. But you can definitely see that geopolitical risks mm -hmm. and, and risk and uncertainty definitely put a, a favorable pressure on the price on the upside. So I, I, I'd rather, you know, let, let those that are more, spil more skilled and, and, and their role is to pick prices on gold to kind of opine on that. Uh, moving on to jewelry demand on your website, it does say that... Uh, India and China are by far the largest jewelry markets together, accounting for over 50% of the global total. Uh, before that, uh, the website stated that this has de jewelry demand uh, still accounts for about roughly 50% of total gold demand. That's a huge number. Can you tell us about the trends? Can you tell us about the trends of the uh, global jewelry market? Sure. The jewelry, the jewelry market has been significantly impacted, I think, for the first half by, by COVID, I should say. And I think for the first half of the year, what we were seeing uh, are, are continual pressures on the on the downside in terms of the demand for jewelry. Uh, I think we are still uh, year on year. I think we're still down 12 percent from, from pre-pandemic levels in terms of the overall demand uh, at about 453 tons. But but what you what you need to appreciate with the jewelry demand is that, um, that that's a that's a consumer based business, and that's a business that when consumers are comfortable, confident and they aren't living in a cost of living crisis or they aren't living in fears of inflation and they're not saving, then, then you're gonna start to see jewelry come online. I think seasonality plays as well into jewelry demand in places like India, for example, uh, during rain season, we don't see as much of a demand as maybe we would see in other times of the years, uh, other times of the year. Uh, I think ultimately what you need to watch with jewelry are the trends that come online over the next six months. Okay. Uh and India and China will continue to be the dominant markets in this field? For, gen for jewelry demand, yes. The affinity for gold, in particular in the form of jewelry in India and China, will continue to make them the standouts as, as the source of the demand uh, in the jewelry category, for sure. Okay. Um, and, and the potential- In the case of, the case of China, I think, I think let's see how things develop in terms of reducing the amount of lockdowns, the, the, the ability for people to get out and get back to some sense of a normalcy of life. Yeah, I mean, China has recently banned the holding of gold as an investment, but you, you don't see that weighing down on jewelry demand at all? No, I don't think so. As a matter of okay. fact, I think the reaction will likely be that people will maybe look at other mechanisms to go ahead and, and get access to gold, whether it's through exchange-traded funds because they're products that are onshore, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's through jewelry demand or bar coin demand or, or gold accumulation plans. I know there's a lot of um, sentimental and perhaps religious reasons for why the Indians and the Chinese hold gold. Uh, I wonder if those factors would be affected by a possible slowdown in the economy, a global recession, if you want to call it. Yes, I think I think it's a factor. I think that still, even though the the emotional sentiment is there for jewelry demand in the places like India, mm -hmm. it's still form part of a form of savings. And yeah. I think it's the affinity is not only just emotional. I think it's also actually really interesting. It's actually part of a, a, a more broad scheme of just how do you accumulate wealth and savings and feel good? Now, mm. you know, in the Indian market, there's some really interesting things that are developing. Now, we just recently announced that the Indian Gold Bullion Exchange has been launched. So what that is, is a really big moment in the Indian market to, to really try and bring better transparency and better harmonization around the trading of the gold market which is kind of on the path of what we're really intending to try and do as an organization, which is to increase trust and transparency around the gold market. So the team in India has been working with the entire industry and has really achieved a major, major milestone by launching the Indian Gold Bullion Exchange. It's really exciting times. Mm -hmm. And let's keep an eye on how that will impact yeah. overall, how people will act and want to start to behave and trade and, and take a position in gold, whether it's through jewelry or through investment. Uh, central bank demand is another huge component, and it's interesting how the uh, tides have shifted towards the eastern central banks over the last two decades. So, for example, Canada has been selling off its gold reserves ever since uh, the early uh, 90s all the way to the mid-2000s, and then Canada is the only G7 country that doesn't hold any gold reserves, actually. Uh, but w recently, in the last 10 years or so, we've seen eastern countries like China and Russia 
become the biggest buyers of gold. Why, why is this tide shifting towards the east, Joe? It's a really interesting and great topic. I think there's probably in the range of 20 central banks that have been consistently and regularly buying, yeah. many of them emerging market, but you're right, China, Russia, other central banks are actually large consumers of gold. And it's simply put, uh, it's the same method that most people are, and same thinking that most people have when they start thinking about their investment portfolios, obviously in the form of reserve currency, but what the asset brings to that reserve currency portfolio is diversification in the right kind of way. The benefits that come along with having a, a safe haven asset that has the right kind of behavior when risk assets are moving. And I think that ultimately central banks are understanding that it's a key component and a liquid component and an easy component to get access to, to build out a well-rounded and a well-diversified reserve por por uh, currency portfolio. Okay. Joe, this is rumor. It's just a murmuring um, that I've heard from people, commentators, that uh, it's possible China is building up uh, or we're constructing a central bank digital currency, but backed by gold, which is one of the reasons why over the last 10, 15 years or so, they've been very active in buying gold. Russia, possibly as well. They're building a basket of currencies that are backed by hard commodities like gold and moving away from the dollar. Is this something that you've observed or have you seen any evidence for this at all? It's nothing that we've heard or nothing that we've been engaged in in terms of working on a project of that nature. Okay. What I think is actually um, uh, actually a very interesting dynamic around the gold market, not necessarily related to China or the central banks, is, is exactly what's happening in terms of the effort that the industry is putting forward to kind of bring the gold market into the future. Uh, there, there's a lot of attempts on the part of many market participants to bring gold into the world of blockchain, uh, digitizing gold. And, and there's a lot of work that I'm sure many firms are doing uh, yes. to, to kind of figure out how to get gold in the right way into a digital, a digital world, the future world of blockchain. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to move on to the last pillar of demand, which is industrial demand, and then we'll move on to some other fun topics, Joe. Uh, industrial demand for gold is something that's often overlooked by investors. It's often, gold is often overshadowed by its uh, uh, younger sister, Silver, because Silver mm -hmm. has a lot more industrial properties that are making headlines nowadays. But it's interesting to note some of the more uh, obscure uh, industrial uses for gold that I personally find interesting. Now, the gold World Gold Council has recently uh, issued a documentary called The Golden Thread. Uh, one, yeah. of the, uh, one, one, of the, one of the episodes in this series was particularly interesting to me. Uh, it was talking about the various industrial properties of gold that I didn't know about, one of them being being that gold nanoparticles can be used in chemotherapy to reduce the side effects of treating cancer. This is very interesting. Can you comment on this? Perhaps other industrial uses people might not know about? One of the problems of chemotherapy is that the way we look at it is that we're essentially injecting a poison into the body. And you're just hoping that the poison kills the tumor better than the healthy tissues. And so what gold nanoparticles can do is that you can actually place a chemotherapy on the surface of the particle. You can actually protect the drug so that it actually doesn't get exposed to the healthy tissues and they can bind to cells that are sick and then you can release the drug and kill it at that particular point. You have potentially less side effects and a more effective treatment. Very much so. I, you know, we're, we're really proud of the work the team did to put that, that, that Golden Thread series together because it's... Yeah. It's such an appropriate thing to put in front of people to talk about the gold market. So often everyone thinks, in particular in North America, they think about futures contracts, they think about the next three months, they think about a role, they think about investment, mm -hmm. they think about gold, and they worry about the price like we just talked about. But what people are really missing is that gold is everywhere. You know, you talked about the, the, the industrial use around uh, about the medical testing. It's an incredible series and an incredible video on that. I personally... Uh, took to the to the series in the video around auto racing. I thought that was fantastic about the mm -hmm. McLaren race cars that use it. It's in technology, but let me bring it even closer home for people, in particular yeah. the youth of the nations. And I think what they need to understand is you don't have an iPhone unless you have gold. You don't have an iPad unless you have gold. So it's everywhere. And that's actually what the series is intended to do is just to raise awareness. And look, we talk about technology and it's a small component of the demand. You know, somewhere in the range of what, maybe 50, 60 tons on a quarterly to a half year basis. So it's definitely, like you said, the smaller, often forgot about component, but don't underestimate the value of it because it's ultimately everywhere. And that's what the series highlights, which is great. 
Um, do you ever foresee a scenario in which there is a scarcity of gold to meet rising industrial demand? Is that possible? Well, I think that there's uh, a number of mining companies that are still producing. I think that the supply side and the recycling side are more than adequate to 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 continue to bring feedstock into the system and 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 meet the demand trends. But I think ultimately, uh, what you're going to find is that where you're going to see the increasing level of of interest and pressure yeah. is as trust and transparency on the gold market continues to to grow and improve. You're going to see demand increasing. So that's what you're going to see. This is an interesting story that popped up on my uh, radar uh, <laughs> uh, recently. Uh, dated uh, early July, Uganda apparently has discovered 31 million tons of gold ore deposits. I don't know what they're doing with this, but that's a, that's a very big number. Uh, critics of gold uh, have been using this as an example to highlight the fact that gold is not actually scarce. Michael Saylor actually tweeted this. He's a CEO of uh, MicroStrategy. He said, gold is plentiful, Bitcoin is scarce. I'm not going to get into the whole Bitcoin versus gold debate, now, but I do want to highlight the fact that uh, a lot of gold has recently been discovered. Um, perhaps gold is not scarce. I'll just That's just a question. I'll let you address that. Well, I'll tell you what, the <laughs> article that you cited around Uganda, let's yeah. see how that plays out. Yeah. But in the meantime, with respect to those that are pundits for the cryptocurrency space, mm -hmm. uh, scarcity doesn't seem to have had an impact on the price performance of Bitcoin. It hasn't proved to be the inflation hedge that everyone said it was going to be. It hasn't proved to be the dollar replacement that everyone said it was going to be yet. Now, look, the world is going to you know, see how things go for the next you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years. All but right. All the excuses and the uh, all the I should say all the different rationalizations of what Bitcoin is, what it isn't is a, a replacement for gold. That's pretty simple. And and I think the other thing that I'd mention around cryptocurrencies in general is there's lots of really interesting research that we've done, not trashing the cryptocurrency space, but sure. explaining the differences between gold and 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 cryptocurrencies. And there's a lot of really good stuff that we can offer people in terms of our content to get them educated on the space. So it's a yeah. risk asset. It's an asset that could fit in people's portfolio, but don't try and say it's one or the other. That's how I'd position it. Well, you do have a program that marries blockchain technology with gold, and we're gonna talk about that towards the end of this interview. But first, I wanna talk about an ad campaign that the World Gold Council has recently launched entitled Gold is for Everyone. We'll play a brief clip of that. But um, uh, basically, you, the, the ad campaign is really just that. You're, you're trying to explain to people that gold is for all investors, all holders, regardless of your age group, regardless of your demographic and uh, your personal background. Um, we understand the properties of gold from uh, from an investment standpoint. We talked about that earlier. I just want to bring this fact up to you and um, <laughs> ask you to address this. It's a recent article from Yahoo Finance. It says, Millennials and Gen Zers are more invested in the stock market than any other financial assets, including cryptos. It says, A new survey finds that Millennials and members of Gen Z are more invested in the stocks than any other financial assets. So if you were to talk to a younger person, 18 to 24, under 25, and you were to convince that person that gold is for that person, what would you say? It's very simple. So first, you know, next generation consumption is, is, is critical to everyone who's trying to grow their business. And it, it's it's front and center and a priority for us, which is why we've run the ads with the Auburns, which is why we have recently launched our invest.gold site. We're targeting mm -hmm. retail of all ages to make sure that they can understand gold. So the first thing I'd say, understand the asset and how it performs. And then secondly, you want a diversified portfolio, understand how gold's a component of that portfolio. We're not saying the only thing you need to own is gold. Yeah. Own risk assets, own equities, own bonds. Hey, for that matter, take a, take a view on cryptocurrencies if you'd like, but you must understand that the right kind of diversification benefits that you get in a portfolio from gold is critical. And so you should have it as a core holding in your portfolio and hold it for the long term. It's one of those things that you put in your portfolio you leave it, it does what it needs to do, and it helps you out when you need it. And we can show you a range from two and a half to 10% diversification, mm -hmm. different, different benefits, different portfolio mixes, and you'll see exactly how it'll help you over the long haul. So I'd say, have at it with risk assets, buy a mitigating protect, protecting asset in the form of gold and add it in. And okay. by the way, it's available in the, in the stock market through ETFs, it's available in physical form, there's online mechanisms to buy right. it. It's available to you in a multitude of different ways. So just have a good look and get engaged. Okay. Um, 
So you so the younger person would then use gold as where any investor would use gold as primarily an, a hedge against risk. Is, a I diversifier think, to their portfolio. Diversifier portfolio. Understand. Remember, that. gold gold correlates positively in, in rising equity markets. Okay. So that's what I mean when it's the right kind of diversification benefit that you get. Okay. You get the protection when markets are crashing. And you get the positive correlation when markets are growing. There's, there's one more criticism I wanted you to address. I wanted to ask the World Gold Council this for a long time because you guys are the experts on gold. Uh, Warren Buffett is famous for not liking gold. He did buy Barrick shares a while ago, but uh, I think he just liked the stock. But he once stated that gold doesn't do anything. It just sits there and looks at you. Explain to me why he's wrong. Well, Warren is a stock picker. Yeah. So I think that everybody needs to appreciate the fact that that's what he does. That's what he's done for his entire life. And he's a pretty dang good stock picker. Um, so what he's saying to you by picking Barrick is he said, I've gone through the risk profile of what I think is going to perform and doing the job I do, which is picking stocks, I pick one. Mm -hmm. And so I think by default, he is telling you that gold has actually got a place in a portfolio. Now, when he talks about it sitting on the shelf and doing nothing and staring back at you. Yeah. It does that because it's not a risk asset. It's not a risk asset that needs to pay a coupon. It's not a risk asset that kicks off a dividend based on manager's performance or management performance of a company. It's a it's a perfectly acceptable investment, like real estate can be, like mm -hmm. other real assets can be. And and simply because it doesn't have the risk profile that requires those components doesn't mean it doesn't have price appreciation over time. And yeah. return profile that's beneficial. Well, I have to get this question from my friends all the time. Should I buy physical or should I buy futures, ETFs, stocks? What's the preferred investment vehicle here? Well, there's. I think all of those are viable. It all depends on exactly what you're wanting to do and how you want to get it done. But I'd say to you, physical and ETFs. I'd say to you, um, the, the futures products have a have a particular pr product performance that people need to understand in terms of the quarterly role on that. Yeah. So when you're talking about physical. Or, or gold through an internet purchasing, or actually using an exchange traded fund, all acceptable mechanisms. It's simply how easy do you want to make it for yourself? Where are you comfortable leaving it in terms of your holdings? If it's something you're happy for an ETF manager to run and, and use the vaults to hold your gold, or do you want to have it in your own vault or your own home or whatever the case may be? Okay. All acceptable mechanisms. All right. Uh, okay, so finally, I want to touch on the uh, World Gold Council's Gold Bar Integrity Program. It integrates gold bullion with blockchain technology. This was recently launched in March this year. So tell us about this program. What exactly is it supposed to do? What is the objective of this program? Well, I think it's a first step on a long journey that we're going to continue to take, which is really driving you know, positive improvements to the gold market over time, which is about tracking and tracing the source of gold. So in coordination with uh, and cooperation with the LBMA, we launched a Gold Bullion Integrity Program. And it really is just that. You know, we have many people uh, through survey work that we've done who have identified education around the gold market and also trust and transparency around the gold market as impediments to making a decision to buy gold. So mm -hmm. what the Gold Bullion Integrity Program does is it brings forward blockchain technology. And there are a few firms that are actually key to this that are actually being used in a beta environment today to, to work with us on this, including Exedris and Peer Ledger, where they have the type of blockchain database construction in place to help the industry standardize the reporting, trace and track the integrity of these gold bars, and take it all the way back to sourcing so that you can feel good and comfortable that knowing where the gold's coming from, how it's made its way through the system, and where it ultimately is residing in terms of the stocks of the gold in the system. It's a really cool first step of mm -hmm. using better and, and smarter and, and more, more modernized technology to track and trace source gold. It's are, really- are, Is it tracking the ores coming out of the ground or the bullion that's been minted? What, what, what exactly is it tracking? There's multiple, there's multiple different applications and actually all okay. the different companies in the value chain can have a potential use of this integrity program. Um, but I'd say from my seat, sitting in a seat where we're looking at things from like the investment side of things, you can see an application with exchange traded funds, for example, where the right. bar list that they currently maintain and put up on their websites might be incorporated and, and consolidated through a different platform, for example, like with Exedris. So you've got a lot of different applications that are going to come from it. So it's, really it's not, it, it's, it's, uh, it's optional, this service, or is it is it going to be implemented on all the Boolean um that's uh, that's uh, being minted. Uh, how does how, how does it work? So, what what are your clients basically? 
So where we are right now in the yeah. program and where we are with respect to rolling out the, the, the integrity program is I that see. it's on a roadmap of implementation by the industry. It's a group of organizations okay. that have come together and joined, willingly joined the group and, and actually have a plan to implement. So we're in beta testing now with the technologies and actually mm -hmm. it's, it's being embraced by, by a number of different firms, whether it's from transportation, from mining, from refining, or ultimately from vaulting and holding and even on the investment side. So firms are out there looking at it and willingly embracing it and looking at a timeline to get it implemented in coordination with the LBMA. Okay, uh, there is one criticism that uh, I'd like you to address of this concept, not necessarily this program, but the concept of um, marrying uh, blockchain technology with gold, which is that uh, one, of the, one of the tenets of owning gold is that it's an untraceable store of wealth um, it's portable, it's offline, but by doing this, you're removing the offline component. You're making it more easy to track and trace and potentially have bad actors or potentially even the governments seize it or know exactly what you're doing with the money, which defeats the purpose of owning gold for some people, not everybody. How would you respond to that? I think that an industry needs to have trust. And I think an industry needs to be trusted by people that want to be a part of it. And if trust is an impediment for greater adoption in gold, because some people feel that being off the grid is a better way than being on the grid. Mm -hmm. We'd rather embrace trust and transparency and grow the industry in a legitimate way and make it better. And let me give one kind of key example of where sure. trust and transparency has impeded the, the, the gold market in, in particular in certain financial markets. So, so as, as an asset under you know, the Bank and International Standards kind of rating scale, uh, gold doesn't necessarily perform all that well in that kind of a standard. And it does so, it doesn't, I should say, simply because of the way the capital is attracted at a balance sheet level for gold on the basis of a lack of true transparency around really what's trading and how it's basically moving. So if you can improve the overall capital weighting of gold on a financial institution's book of business by better transparency, that far outweighs anyone who's trying to uh, take gold into their possession uh, and try and keep it out of the trans uh, out of the out of the spotlight in terms of trading and activity so um, none of this stuff that we're doing either is mm -hmm. going to prevent anyone from simply saying I'd like to take physical delivery of gold sure so that's actually something that is actually very much available to them and we're not trying to stop that from happening at all all okay. we're simply saying is that for tracking and tracing and transparency we want to see an improvement in the overall Gold market and this technology will help that happen. Great. All right. Well, Joe, best of luck with this program and uh, for the research that the WGC continues to put out. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more.